thank you, Cindy, for that really uh, nice introduction. Cindy and I were neighbors up until a few weeks ago, and I emphasize everything, and you'll see how much I like basketball, unfortunately, in these slides. So um, obviously, for 30 minutes, 40 minutes to go over everything in foot and ankle is impossible. So I'm hoping to hit the kind of major highlights and leave a, a few times where I'm sure you guys have some questions. Um, so these are the top five things in foot and ankle primary care that I think are, are plaguing you guys. These are also the top five things that I see in my clinic too. Um, so I'll try and give you as many insights as I can, as I can get through. So we're going to talk about plantar fasciitis, Achilles tendonitis, Achilles ruptures, ankle sprains. I always like to include Liz Frank. And I really like talking about Achilles ruptures and Liz Franks because these are things that are often missed. And there are things that if they are missed, can be a real problem later, but if they're caught early, um, then treatment can really uh, do well for people. And of course, we have to talk about bunions. All right, so plantar fasciitis is really young looking Andrew Bogut, who used to suffer from this. So um, this affects men and women of all ages. About 10% of Americans have some form of heel pain. I guarantee there's a bunch of you in this room that are suffering from this. I have family members who call me and complain all the time about their heel pain. All right, so this is, represents almost 1 million annual visits to the doctor for heel pain. Um, and plantar fasciitis is probably the largest, representing probably 85 to 90% of all that heel pain. Um, generally, these are people who have plantar medial heel pain. It's often worse in the morning, but not always. People will say it'll be worse with activity. It'll flare up, it'll flare down, um, but it can be something that they, people are long suffering. And we'll go over the physical exam next. And one of the nice parts about the foot and ankle physical exam is the foot not having a lot of musculature around it, things are readily accessible to palpation. And so this is just a representation. This represents, you know, probably the area of a, of a silver dollar or so. And you can see these are four different actual um, causes of pain in the heel, not all plantar fasciitis. And by kind of isolating exactly where they are, you can do a good job of figuring out exactly what's going on. And that's really a key for foot and ankle physical exam, which we'll go through, thankfully, in the next talk. And plantar fasciitis, as you can see right there, typically is right on that plantar medial aspect of the heel. Sometimes people will say it kind of goes into the arch. People will say it kind of runs up the medial side of the leg a little bit, but that's generally the spot. And that's because that's right where that plantar fascia inserts. It inserts on that medial aspect of the calcaneus, and the plantar fascia runs actually all the way down to the base of the toes. It's what allows you to create your arch, allows you to walk, and obviously from doing that, it takes a lot of force and a lot of pressure. So this area is under a lot of stress. And when that origin of this big fascial tissue gets irritated, it can be painful, and that's really what plantar fasciitis is. Oftentimes we'll get bone or get x-rays and you do see bone spurs and you'll see here you can see this kind of lateral plantar or this uh, plantar heel spur that people have. People see that and they see the x-ray report and they say well I have bone spurs and that's what's causing the pain and this is really a sign of it not the symptom of, or a, <clears throat> a sign of the problem not the problem. It's definitely not the bone spur that's causing the problem though it looks like that spike is heading down and people can visualize it just pushing into the ground and causing pain. It's really the inflammation surrounding that. And the reason that they get the bone spur is the tug on um, that fascial band onto the bone, kind of pulling that bone around. It's, it's, it's the body's normal response to the physiologic pressure that's there. And you'll see a lot of people with no pain that have these spurs. And I try and encourage people that it's not the spurs. And I guarantee you, taking out those bone spurs is a bad, bad idea. Um, <clears throat> so when you go through physical exam of these people, you want to palpate, especially along that plantar medial heel, um, oftentimes these people will have Achilles and gastroc tightness and hamstring tightness, usually tightness that goes all the way down the back of the leg, hamstring, gastroc Achilles, and then plantar fascia, they go hand in hand. And so that's really where the treatment comes in this is really kind of getting these people stretched out. And yeah, they may or may not have this bone spur. It's there a lot, but it doesn't mean anything really. So treatment, treatment for this is almost always non-operative. All right, I shouldn't say conservative, I should get that out of my vernacular. So it's non-operative and it may take many months to resolve. So, you know, the biggest thing you can do, I think for your patients is be encouraging and be a coach in their corner, telling them that this will get better if you do the right thing. It takes a long time, but have faith that it'll get better. Um, just as an anecdotal segment, a roommate of one of our residents came to see me. She'd been suffering for a year and a half of plantar fascia. She came to see me. She had done everything. She brought in her list of everything she had tried. She had tried literally everything. We went through her list, 
you know, it's a year and a half. She's in tears. I saw her at a year and a half. I saw her at a year and nine months. She was ready to do surgery, which I was, you know, coaching her through. I was like, let's try some other things. She saw me at two years, suffering for two years. She finally said she was getting better. Finally kind of hit the other side of the arc. Never ended up doing surgery. And thankfully, I haven't seen her back. And last I heard, she was back running and doing everything. So it can be a really long course to get it resolved. But uh, you can get it resolved through non-operative means. You just got to stay the course. And what does this usually mean? Well, usually it's Achilles and gastroc and plantar fascial stretching. Um, this is probably the most crucial thing to do is to get everything stretched out so you're relieving the pressure that's being exerted on that postremedial heel and really re helping to relieve the inflammation. Heel cups can be helpful, just kind of patting that area. Over-the-counter arch supports can be a little helpful too. Um, you know, uh, it's a, if you talk to the podiatrist versus the orthopedic foot and ankle surgeons, there's some debate about you know, arch supports and, you know, the podiatry community really is a firm believer in it. The orthopedic community less so, and it's really a little more nuanced. Um, but these can be helpful. I, I really have a hard time recommending um, custom arch supports for people unless they have a really weird foot shape. Because custom arch supports these days are almost never covered by insurance, and they run about $500. Over-the-counter arch supports, $20 or $30 you can get them for people. So if they don't work, they're only out, you know, $20 or $30, not the end of the world. Night splints can be really helpful, especially for people who have pain in the morning. Um, what a night splint does is it just helps keep your uh, plantar fascia and your gastroc and your Achilles stretched out at night when you're sleeping. All of us, no matter how we sleep, on your back, your side, your stomach, we all plantar flex our foot when we sleep. That's a natural position. And so when you wake up in the morning, you're just putting that foot back down on the ground, stretching everything out that's been contracted through the night. So keeping it stretched out at night can be really helpful. Caveat to this, of course, is not everyone is able. Some people will tell you that they just cannot sleep with the night splint on. Um, so I really encourage people, like, give it a few days, really kind of fight through it. Once people get comfortable with it after the first few days, then people will feel really better with it. And some people will tell you that they just can't sleep without it or they're just miserable the next day without it. So they really do work. Um, sometimes if people have especially a really bad acute flare of their plantar fasciitis, um, getting them to calm down, either in a cam walker for four weeks or a cast for four weeks, can be really helpful. And again, you're just calming down that inflammation. In a cast or a cam walker, you're, the uh, plantar fascia isn't firing, and the gastroc and the Achilles aren't firing either. So it really does help to calm them down. Um, as far as injections go, unfortunately, this is something where, as Dr. Lanzam pointed out, uh, I wish that PRP worked. Unfortunately, the trials haven't shown it does. Um, I do sometimes do steroid injections into these people. Um, when do I do it? Well, I do it when they've kind of failed other things because it does have an increased rupture rate. The thing I'll say, the difference between this and like the Achilles is a rupture of your plantar fascia is actually not the end of the world. What happens if you rupture your plantar fascia, you put them in a boot or a cast for four to six weeks, it heals in and they're generally fine. Interestingly enough, if people fully rupture their plantar fascia, what they do is they actually stretch out their plantar fascia a little bit. So sometimes that rupture will be the thing that actually helps resolve their plantar fasciitis. It's a little bit of a, of a catch-22, um, but it's not the end of the world, so I don't mind. I do warn people about it, and oftentimes with people that are really kind of symptomatic, I will inject them and then put them in a cast to try and protect them. But you're really, it's kind of the full deal to get them to kind of calm themselves down. Um, and it does, they are fairly effective. So this is something I, I give the, uh, the spine surgeons a hard time about, but that's, this is Steve Kerr. This is his quote to the, uh, I think he was on radio when he said this, but he said, I can tell you if you're listening out there, if you have plantar fasciitis, stay away from surgery. Actually, he said back surgery, but stay away from surgery. <laughs> I can say that from the bottom of my heart, rehab, 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 don't let anyone get in there. And this is generally how I feel. And I'm a surgeon. I love doing surgery. Um, but the surgery results are very mixed. And you do see a fair amount of people that get worse after surgery. So this is where I tell people you really want to encourage them. It's been six months. It's been nine months. Stay the course. You know, fight the good fight. And, you know, and it really will get better. So I, it's, it's worth the coaching and the really being encouraging these people. And you can get them better without surgery. In surgery, what do you do if you get to that point? Typically what we do is usually gastroc or Achilles lengthening to help offload that and sometimes you'll do a partial plantar fascia release. But again, that is a very, very last resort. In four years of being an attending surgeon and probably 12,000 office visits, I guarantee I've seen probably five to 600 patients with plantar fasciitis have operated once in that time. So, um, you know, it's something that you do with extreme caution. 
So another area where people will get heel pain um, a little further up is on the Achilles. And the Achilles tendonitis is incredibly common. It does also hit men and women of all ages. It's really activity related. We see it in young athletes, older athletes, and we see it in people who just have normal lives and are just walking around. Somewhere between two to 10% of the general population. That's how common this is. And if you're a runner, congratulations, you're probably gonna have Achilles tendonitis at some point. 25 to 50% of runners will have it at some point. And what this is, is this pain in the Achilles tendon with activity. So this shouldn't, pain when people are having, lying in bed, things like that, that's when you really worry about nerve symptoms, kind of other things, but this should really be more related to activity. It's one of the things you can isolate. And Achilles tendinopathy really comes in two varieties. It comes in this mid-substance Achilles tendinopathy, and it comes in insertional Achilles tendinopathy and tendinitis. Um, and so you want to, you usually be able to distinguish pretty easily between the two. These people usually have a pretty distinctive swelling within their Achilles um, if it's mid-substance or right at the insertion in this so-called pump bump. You get this posterior calcaneal bone spur. Again, it's not necessarily the bone spur that's causing the symptoms. It's really more of a sign of the symptoms that are there, of this kind of swelling that's going on. But they do get, and when you get x-rays, you can see um, spurring on the back there. Um, Unfortunately, this is another area where you know, PRP trials have not borne out. Um, actually, it was hopeful that they might bear out, especially in the mid-substance, um, but they haven't really borne out. So when we talk about treatment, again, we always like to start with non-operative treatment for these patients, and the majority of these people will get better, probably 90 to 95%. So this is ice, rest, NSAIDs. Heel lifts can be helpful. Interestingly enough, when people went to the kind of the natural, the zero drop shoes and the born to run kind of epidemic that swept us and still caught up in maybe or not, depending on who you talk to. I had a lot of runners that came in that were having, you know, had a little bit of uh, a heel lift in their running shoes. They went to a zero drop shoe and lo and behold, they got Achilles tendonitis. And it makes perfect sense. You're stretching out the Achilles that wasn't as stretched out before. And so sometimes even a little bit of a heel lift, a small heel lift can be really helpful for these patients. You don't have to do it forever, um, but just kind of until their symptoms resolved. And similar to, you know, the plantar fasciitis, a period of immobilization can sometimes be really helpful, especially if people are having, gosh, they just really can't walk. They're really just struggling to go to work, things like that. Putting them in a cast or a boot um, can really help relieve these symptoms. Again, that's, you know, we're talking four, kind of six weeks max, because uh, then otherwise you start to get atrophy and other problems, um, knee and hip pain, things like that. This is something where I never do steroid injections because of the rupture rate. Rupturing the plantar fascia, like we said, is not that big a deal. Um, actually, if you ruptured your gastroc fascia, it wouldn't be a big deal. But rupturing your Achilles tendon is a huge deal. Um, you know, that's a, we'll talk about it a little bit in the next segment here, but you're talking about a really long recovery, loss of strength, things like that. So this is something to where I just, blanket statement, don't do steroid injections on this. And then this is another area where surgery is really reserved for people with uh, failed conservative management. The difference of Achilles tendonitis is that actual surgical inventions have a very good track record. You're talking 85 to 90% good results for this. So I do much more of these surgeries than I do for plantar fascia because you really can't help these people. That being said, still the majority of people, you're able to improve their symptoms, get them back to normal life without having to go under the knife. So Achilles ruptures, um, these are a relatively rare event, but I like including this because it's another thing that's often missed. There are things where people come to their uh, primary care provider, they come to the urgent care, they come to the emergency department, um, and they get missed because they're generally not that painful. And we'll kind of go over it in the physical exam. This is like the easiest physical exam that exists and probably the best. It's like the best thing you can do. Um, it's generally men in their 30s and 40s. You get these athletes and weekend warriors. It's about seven for, sorry for my numbers that are off, seven for 100,000 of the population, so it's relatively rare. Um, but only about 10% will have prior Achilles symptoms. We talked to Kobe Bryant, he isn't feeling anything. If you talk to Richard Sherman this year, he says his Achilles have been bothering him kind of the whole year. And he, when he ruptured, he's like, yeah, I expect that to happen, which is interesting. But so the majority of people are feeling nothing the whole year, and, but about 10% have some twinge back there. And it is relatively painless. If you watch uh, Kobe Bryant, after this, this was actually against the Warriors. There's Harrison Barnes standing over him. Yeah, sorry, I, I do love basketball, Send you put in. Um, he goes and shoots free throws after these and makes both his free throws and then walks off, limps off, you know. Uh, if you watch Adam Wainwright for the uh, Cardinals a few years back, he ran all the way to first base. He's like, God, I feel like I sprained my ankle. 
Um, you know, and I called Dr. Lansdowne after that, and I was like, I'm sorry, your ace pitcher's out for the year because he tore his Achilles. Just watching it, you knew it happened. These people will say that they feel like they got kicked in the heel and they'll walk funny and they'll limp, but it isn't necessarily painful, and that's why these get missed, and that's why I like kind of harping on it. So the Achilles tendon, it's the biggest tendon in the back. It has this 90 degree crisp, and it inserts broadly over the posterior calcaneus, and you get this watershed area to where the blood supply is kind of minimized at about four to six centimeters proximal insertion. So that's where the majority of these ruptures occur, and it's thought that there is some microfracture within the tendon that's kind of weak in the tendon, for a gentleman like Richard Sherman, probably had some kind of small inflammation tearing, and then you get this one seminal forced dorsiflexion event that kind of you get this catastrophic failure of the tendon in. Now, this is my favorite part of this because it's so easy to diagnose. Um, so these people will generally have a palpable defect. They'll have decreased plantar flexion strength, but because of their other muscles, because of their uh, TBLS posterior, their FHL, their FDL, these people generally can still push their foot down. Um, but when you get them lying on the table, we'll show you here in a little bit, they'll have a decreased resting tome and this, the, the Thompson's test. Calf squeeze and you look to see if they have any plantar flexion. And you do it on both sides because you want to compare one side to the other. And Thompson's test is actually better than an MRI, which is great. This is like the, this is why I love this physical exam. I can harp on it for everyone, for my residents, for when I have medical students. This, this should, these should never get missed. That's kind of the irony of this. This is so easy to do, and this is a 98 to 99% sensitive test. You can't beat that. All right, so, and if you do see someone who you suspect has a Achilles rupture, I harp on my residents, and for you guys too, if possible, put them in a plantar flexion splint or a cast, one of the two. If you put them in a boot, they will take it off. Guaranteed, everyone does, it's human nature, right? So get them in a splint. Some people are just absolutely no way and there's nothing you can do, and it, maybe you don't have the ability to you know, splint them in your clinic or whatever it is, then put them in a cam walker and tell them they are not allowed to take it off. And the reason for that is if you see them early and you put them in a plantar fashion splint, then they can have the potential of not doing surgery and still getting the Achilles healed. One of the things that's come out in my world, in the foot and ankle world, in the last five years has been a growing, you know, controversy about whether or not to fix these or not. And I'll tell you, it's probably pretty evenly split. And the literature is pretty good on both sides. And what I tell my patients these days, I say the good news is I can get you healed, I can get you back to your previous level of activity with surgery or without. And there's a kind of a few pros and cons on each end that, you know, depending on patient-specific things, you might tune your treatment to their specific, uh, you know, situation. However, the good news is you can do both, and it's really good. So the pros for surgery is you know that you get that tension of the tendon to the proper spot, and that to me is the whole key. That allows them to have proper strength functioning going forward. Likely a lower re-rupture rate. This is a little bit debatable in the literature. Some pe people like to feel like they did something, right? Achilles recovery is a long recovery, so people like to know, hey, I know that I did the most thing you know, the, I did something here. It's not just kind of sitting in a boot in a cast for a while. Um, sorry, this didn't, I didn't say this, but you actually have a slightly better return to high functioning activity. So there's one study out of military recruits and they were looking at, and the trend in the military used to be everyone got fixed and they've moved to no one gets fixed and they kind of prospectively watched all those people. And what they found is that actually the people that got fixed got back to active duty about a month and a half to two months quicker than their non-op. And this was a kind of an incidental finding within their study. And that's been kind of the anecdotal thing if you talk to people is that the, so for the really high level athletes, Richard Sherman's and Kobe Bryant's, a month and a half is several million dollars. For a lot of us, you know, a month and a half but to, of getting back to weekend basketball is not that big a deal. It may not be worth the risks of surgery and things like that. And so that's where I'm thinking about tailoring your, your treatment for individual people is a good idea. And if you see them early and get them in a splint or a cast early, though, you leave both options open, which is great. And then yeah, some people will say, I, I want what Richard Sherman got. I want what Kobe got, you know, that type of thing, depending on who you are. Um, if you're a 49ers fan, maybe you don't want what Richard Sherman got. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> obviously, the cons of this are, are cost and, you know, a higher complication rate. The complication rate is pretty low with Achilles surgery, I'll tell you. We do much smaller incisions than we used to. We've kind of tailored our incisions. You can do percutaneous repairs with really an incision that's about, you know, two centimeters um, or so long. And so the wound complications that used to plague Achilles surgery 
aren't there. But if you have a patient who's a smoker, is a diabetic, you know, like Dr. Ward talked about, it's probably just not worth it for them um, to kind of have that risk. Non-operative treatment, you do get less complications. Um, the cons are you probably have a higher uh, re-rupture rate. The tension might not restore it as well. And what I tell people is non-op treatment is not no treatment. Non-op treatment is a very, very specific rehab protocol that they have to follow to a T if they want to achieve the same results you get with surgery. And so patients who are non-compliant in both arms just don't do well because it's really the, the surgery is one thing, the non-op protocol is one thing. It has to be followed really to a T. But if you, the good news is if you do that, you do really get good results. Um, and it really does work well. I actually had a friend of Dr. Ma uh, recently who I treated non-operatively, and I just saw him back at six months, and he looks great, and he's, like, ready to go back. And he was playing basketball. It's always basketball. scares the heck out of me. Um, and he's ready to go back. Actually, it's six months. He's still weak because usually recovery takes a full year, um, but you can get good uh, results on both ends, and so that's the nice part about it. Um, and this is kind of what I'm talking about. So the... RCTs that have come out, and these have really kind of come out of, as you might imagine, uh, areas with more socialized medicine, so New Zealand, Australia, and then the Nordic countries have kind of pioneered these studies with these early functional rehab protocols, and this is what I mean. We do see similar results at a year um, as far as uh, uh, getting back to work, getting back to sports, things like that. It's actually an interesting study out of Canada, not yet published, that was at our most recent meeting. Um, that Alex Younger was talking about, and he's actually shown that because the pendulum has now swung so far the other way towards non-operative, they've ended up doing a lot more late Achilles repairs because, again, it's not that no treatment or non-operative treatment is equivalent. It's that non-operative treatment with a very specific regimented protocol is equivalent. So if people fall off that, then sometimes they need surgery later on. So they've actually seen their acute surgeries go down, but their delayed surgeries in Canada go way up as a result of kind of the way the pendulum swings. And so that's where I'm, I kind of harp on getting people treated appropriately early uh, makes the big difference. So ankle sprains. So ankle sprains are obviously incredibly common. Um, 600,000 ankle sprains per year in the US. In, in the UK, it's three to 5% of all ED visits. So I mean, it's a huge percentage of you know, our healthcare dollars are even seeing these. Um, symptoms, people have pain in ankle, swelling, difficulty with, with uh, walking. And this is, you know, the typical ankle sprains, this is an outline here of the lateral ligaments that help stabilize the ankle. The two biggest ones are the anterior talofibular ligament between the talus and the fibula, and then the calcaneofibular ligament between the calcaneus and the fibula. These are the most commonly sprained. Um, we grade sprains one to three depending on how much of a tear there is, and I tell people it doesn't matter. It really doesn't. Most people who sprain their ankles, uh, they tear their ligaments to a greater or lesser degree. And actually, the grade of sprain really doesn't matter. And they, this has been borne out many times. And the important thing here is as long as the uh, talus is sitting underneath, so as long as the mortise is maintained with these sprains, then they don't need surgery acutely. Sometimes they need it later. Um, so 95% of ankle sprains are asymptomatic at a year, kind of no matter what you do, which is a little bit interesting. You can cast them, you can kind of leave them alone, you can do nothing, and most of these people will be fine. However, there is good evidence that early rehabilitation, so if you get these people in to see the physical therapist early, those people do better and they do better earlier. So I really try to get people in to see our athletic trainers, if they're uh, athletes that have a school that is blessed with an athletic trainer, or the physical therapist, um, if they're older people, out of school, things like that, because it really does make a difference. Um, and I do really recommend actually limiting their early immobilization. The, the longer you stay in the boot, the longer you stay in the boot is kind of my you know, montage of this. So you know, I really try, for people that have lesser sprains that aren't as bad, their swelling is not as bad, I really try to get them out after a week. For people that are a little bit worse, three weeks, and three weeks is kind of my max before I really try to get people out. People start to atrophy, they start to become dependent. It, you just see that it takes them longer and longer the longer they stand. So that's why I try to get people into, into see the athletic trainers or to see the physical therapist early because it really does help them kind of progress out of this earlier. And surgical repair is reserved for those with prolonged symptoms after months of instability. So the analogy I draw, if you guys remember two years ago for the Warriors, uh, Clay Thompson had a sprained ankle, he was out two games. Harrison Barnett had a sprained ankle, he was out six weeks. Both of those guys came back. None of those guys got surgery. They're both playing at an all-star level this year. 
Steph Curry, when he was in college, had recurrent sprains. He couldn't get back, he just really had a problem. I will go on record as telling you I was completely wrong, and when they re-signed Curry to his contract, I said it was horrible, because I didn't think he was gonna come back. And I, was, I was wrong, I was wrong. He was off, he was great, <laughs> obviously. But he also has a surgically repaired ankle. He did get his ligaments repaired because of this recurrent thing. Obviously, all three of those guys are playing you know, phenomenal ball at this point. And a lot of what Steph Curry did was the rehab after that that really kind of made the difference. But so for the majority of sprains, they're not going to require surgery, but there are those people that if they continue to have symptoms over time, they do. But you can get them back to a good um, function. High ankle sprains. High ankle sprains are really difficult. And we'll, we'll go through a little of the kind of getting how to diagnose this in, in the physical exam portion next. Um, so the high ankle sprain is not the sprain of the ATFL and the CFL, but actually a sprain of the syndesmosis ligaments. Those are the ligaments that hold the fibula onto the tibia. Um, and when you see these, these are the people who have pain out of proportion to their injury. They just have, at least an ankle sprain, they just have a lot of pain. They really have a prolonged recovery. Um, pain that's posterior to the fibula along the back, not the front. And they have pain that goes up the leg towards their knee. These people often will have a difficulty with kind of standing on one leg. Um, sometimes the ankle sprains, can, the regular ankle sprains can have that too. And it's, these people get especially pain with dorsiflexion of the ankle. So for anyone you're suspicious of a high ankle sprain, and we'll talk about specialty physical exam, kind of how to diagnose that, these are people that I do actually immobilize a little bit longer. So these are the people for whom I will put in the boot for three weeks, sometimes even as long as four or five if they're really symptomatic. Um, and then you kind of start that rehab protocol because it just takes a little bit longer for those syndesmosis ligaments to heal down. So how do you know if it's a sprain versus a fracture, right? And this is the problem. So sprains, you get acute twisting injury, pain at the ankle, bruising, difficulty with weight bearing. Bad sprains will swell up incredibly. I mean, they'll look like they have a watermelon in their ankle. Fractures, acute twisting injury, pain swelling the ankle, bruising, difficult weight bearing. And it's the same mechanism, um, and it can be very similar symptom-wise. Um, so our friends up north kind of came up with these Ottawa ankle rules. I do think that they're valuable. Um, you know, it's a little bit of a different environment here in the U.S. Uh, practicing here. But so what you want to look for, you know, I'm not going to go through these, but any pain with weight bearing at all, they should get an x-ray. Pain any, over any bony prominences, they should get an x-ray. In this case, you know, they talk about pain in the posterior portion of the fibula because the anterior portion is where those sprain ligaments are. So pain there is very typical for a sprain. Reality is in the US, you know, what do I see? Well, here's are things that the auto ankle rules miss. And these are the kind of relatively rare things because they only do a study on 100 or 150 people. They may not see this and it may not come out. So these are the things that I get concerned about. Anterior process of calcaneus fractures get missed. Lateral process of talus fractures get missed. Osteochondral lesions of the talus and loose bodies get missed. And anybody who's neuropathic will be able to walk and dance on a destroyed ankle because they're just not feeling it. So anyone who has any kind of neuropathy, they fall out of this. So I tell people, if you're at all concerned, get an x-ray. You're not going to be ever faulted for getting an x-ray. You know, I appreciate the cost savings and everything that goes into that. But, you know, some of these things can be really devastating if you miss them late. And so... I'll be honest, everyone who comes to my clinic gets an x-ray. If you made it all the way to me, so something is not right, you're getting an x-ray. Um, just to briefly, another thing that gets missed often, so I like talking about it in these talks, Liz Frank. So the Liz Frank joint is the tarsal metatarsal joint. So it runs across actually all five. First, second, third, fourth, and fifth uh, metatarsal. The biggest ligaments we usually talk about are the ones that go between the medial cuneiform and the base of the second metatarsal. It's kind of where you get that keystone, if you guys all remember that from anatomy way back when. And you do have both dorsal and plantar ligaments. The plantar ligaments are the stronger ones, and those are the ones that are concerned. If you tear your dorsal ligaments, not a big deal. If you tear your plantar ligaments, it's a big deal because that normal kind of keystone arch relationship will fail the metatarsals will splay and your arch will collapse. And that's a really big deal if you miss that. Now it's just because they get arthritis later, but they get arthritis with deformity. And arthritis with deformity is a really tough thing to fix and it's something you can really kind of prevent early on. Um, and this usually happens due to direct or indirect contact. This is kind of your classic you know, view that's shown, the football player, the soccer player that has that plantar flexed um, foot. Uh, that then they then get an axial load on and it kind of nutcrackers through that area and, and um, ruptures those plantar ligaments. So these people will have painful walking, they'll have pain in the midfoot. This is kind of your pathognomonic 
physical exam for Liz Frank, this kind of plantar ecchymosis right under that tarsal metatarsal joint. Um, and if you're at all concerned that they need imaging, and what's imaging, appropriate imaging? Appropriate imaging is weight-bearing foot x-rays. A weight-bearing foot x-ray will stress those ligaments. If, and stress those ligaments will show if they're moving or shifting or not. So non-weight-bearing films are not good enough if you're concerned. And so it's the same thing for me. It's if people walk into my clinic, they get weight-bearing x-rays. And I encourage you guys, if you have the ability to, to get weight-bearing x-rays because for the foot and ankle world, they're everything. I mean, they're better than MRIs for a lot of stuff. And in my mind, honestly, actually, this is better than an MRI, weight-bearing x-rays for Liz Franks. All right, so finally, in the next nine minutes, or hopefully less than that, we're talking about bunions. So bunions. So <clears throat> what a bunion is, is is really a kind of deformity of the metatarsal phalangeal joint, the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. And the metatarsal phalangeal joint is a very complicated joint. The knee guys, I know they talk a lot in this conference. They only have one patella. We have two sesamoids. So you have two floating bone articulations with three tendons going around there. We have seven collateral ligaments kind of going around, and it takes all the weight as you bend and go through. So this is a very complicated joint, and, and it acts like a very complicated joint, unfortunately. And so, you know, over time, as your foot kind of wants to accommodate um, to kind of give gravity, you can get this kind of gradual drift of that first metatarsal kind of out to the side, and that's what that hallux valgus, and then you get that kind of curved angle, and that's why we call this hallux valgus. That area around that kind of um, medial exostosis from the bone that then develops into this erythematous painful area is what really gets called the bunion. And so they end up being kind of synonymous, but it really is a deformity of this joint, and it's a complex deformity. Um, usually it's pain in the gray toe, and it's pain with shoe wear, and you get this erythema and, uh, and swelling around that area. And this is kind of showing where that complex anatomy is. Here are the two sesamoids on the bottom. They run in the middle of your flexor hallucis brevis tendons, and the flexor hallucis longest tendon runs in the middle. And there's a little bit of bone called the cristae underneath that kind of helps separate them. As the toe rotates out, both of those sesamoids will rotate laterally, um, and they'll rotate around, and the tendons will contract on one side and flex on the other side. And that cristae will actually get eroded away so people can get... Um, erosions, and there actually is cartilage underneath the sesamoids and the metatarsal articulation. You can get osteochondral defects, arthritis there. And it can just be painful from this abnormal, this is like extreme patella maltracking is what you're seeing here, um, kind of getting out into that spot. Um, and it can be very painful. Oftentimes people just don't like the way it looks too. And I tell people, if you don't like the way it looks, don't look at it. Um, <laughs> Because, uh, you know, our initial treatments for bunions, yeah, uh, shoe wear modification ends up being the biggest ones. You know, people don't make shoes for how they feel on your foot. People make shoes for how they look on the shelf. And so that's what you're buying. You're buying it for how it looks on the shelf. And shoe companies know this up, right, down, and left. And they're not, you know, sitting on millions of dollars. Phil Knight isn't funding the entire University of Oregon based on making, you know, bunion-friendly shoes. That's just not how it works. But orthotics and bunion sleeves and comfortable shoes really can help. And even gastroc stretching, again, to kind of relieve pressure there, it can be really helpful. Um, but it is a deformity. So the only way to actually correct it, to actually get it better, so all the sleeves and pads and everything else, they're not correcting the deformity. They're just helping the symptoms. And that is a totally valid goal because your foot will function fine even though that joint is off. You can still do most of the, most of the things you want to do. And then surgery really ends up being reserved for those who kind of fail non-operative treatment. And there are so many different bunion surgeries described. And I'll tell you, going to the meetings every year, who's doing what changes. And you see this kind of drift of, you know, going back and forth between different surgeries. No one's fully figured this out. So the fact that there's 100 surgeries described means that you know, we haven't fully figured it out. It's because it's such a complex joint and every bunion is not the same. So this is something that I see a lot of patients come in and say, oh, you know, my aunt had surgery, you know, my friend had surgery, she was back in three weeks. And, you know, you just don't know what they had, how bad it was, did they just get a bone shaved? You know, did they have, you know, did they need a big metatarsal osteotomy to really correct the deformity? And so the results really vary, and they vary because different pathology, some people have more arthritis, less arthritis, some people have the crystal eroded, some people, so it's a very nuanced kind of thing. And it, so the results really vary. So you get 70 to 85% of people will tell you that they're happy with the results, but only 65 to 70% will actually get it done on the other side. And the reason for that is it's a very long recovery. 
You know, there's one study out of Japan last year that showed that 18% uh, of bunion patients still had pain in their toe after one year. Um, and that actually goes down to about 10% at two years. So you do get some late recovery, but it's a very long recovery. So I really try and coach my patients. And there's actually a really great study that I hope gets published, which is, I thought we all agree with, Judy Baumhauer out of uh, uh, Rochester is a really awesome foot surgeon. She, it was a poster at the meeting I was at, and I really hope it gets published, but basically what she showed is that people who are doing pretty well, if they get bunion surgery, they don't, they're not super happy with it. People who are doing poorly and get bunion surgery, they're generally happy with it, which is something I think we all agree with. The patients who come in and they're just like, ah, it's hard for me to, to fit in the shoes I want. I really can't wear my five inch stilettos anymore. And I don't like the way it looks. Those people are gonna be unhappy with bunion surgery. The people who are like, you know what? Um, I work as a waitress, I work in retail all day. I'm on my foot all day. It kills me at the end of the day. And I really have trouble just walking. Those people are happy with bunion surgery and do well. And so what I tell people is with surgery, you know, we're able to make a bad toe good, but it's really tough to make a good toe great. So if you have a bad toe that's really killing you, then surgery is a good option for you. But if it's just like, mm, I don't like the way it looks and it's, yeah, it bothers me every now and again, and you know, that's, it's not worth it because it's a long recovery and people are not super happy with the results. Um, so with that, uh, I think I left four minutes for questions. So I'll take any questions if anyone has them.